All right, guys, today we have a very awesome guest. I'm very happy to have her here. So, Jessica, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. How are you? Good, thank you. Hi, Daijo with us. Daijo, are, are you excited? I am excited, yes. It's, uh, it's really cool to be doing something a little bit different from my norm. Definitely. We are super grateful and happy to have you. So, uh, you know, you are in the UK at the moment. I know there's a little bit of a time difference, so I really appreciate you coming into the show. No problem. Awesome. So, Jessica, why don't you tell us your story, your origins? Where did it start? Okay. Wow. <laughs> where to start? So, I currently live in Edinburgh in Scotland, but I'm actually, um, I was born in London and then grew up on the east coast of England. Um, I lived in Japan for five years in Oita Prefecture. Um, I did three years on the JET program. Then I did some time training to be a professional taiko drummer with a group called um, Tao. I think they now go by Drum Tao. Um, and then I did a final year in Japan teaching at a Japanese, uh, an English school uh, for Japanese children. So uh, Eigo Yochien, so kindergarten. Um, after that, I came back to the UK to continue to do the taiko drumming that I had completely fallen in love with. And I came up to audition in Scotland for the taiko group here. And then that's how I ended up moving to Edinburgh. Now, when I arrived in Edinburgh, um, I didn't know anyone, anyone at all. So, uh, and I love Japanese language and culture. So I started going to lots of Japanese language events. Um, classes and I just basically went out there to meet people that had the same interest as me. Um, I signed up for several Japanese language classes because I knew that having done five years in Japan, I really needed to not lose my Japanese language ability. Um, I thought I would have more opportunities to speak Japanese in the Taiko group, but actually ended up being Scottish people, many of whom had never been to Japan. And certainly many of them had never even thought about studying Japanese. They loved Taiko, but for them, it was all about the Taiko. And they learned Japanese through Taiko, but they didn't actually, some of them now began studying, but you know, that for them, it was want to do Taiko, not want to learn Japanese. So I didn't know anyone, went out looking for classes, signed up for classes. And it was always the same story. I would go to the class, there would be a textbook, and we would sit staring at the textbook for the lesson. The teacher would mainly speak to us in English, explaining grammar points. And then the lesson would finish, and we'd be given written homework. And the homework would stay in my bag for a week, and then I would go back to the lesson. The following week, not having done the homework, and I thought, why am I I'm paying for these lessons? I'm, I know I want to speak Japanese. Why am I doing the homework that I'm being given to help me speak Japanese? And then I realized that there was that disconnect that actually wasn't about speaking. What they were doing was teaching me grammar, reading and writing, and to a certain extent, listening. Um, and I thought, but I'm missing the speaking element. So I started turning up to the lesson early and staying behind, the poor teachers just wanted to get away and I would just chat to them in Japanese. And um, I realized that was what my drive was. It wasn't actually, I wasn't actually going for the language instruction. I was going for the, commun the communication opportunities, the, the conversation. And um, after a few weeks of kind of figuring this out, that I wasn't getting what I wanted from the classes, I asked other people in the class, you know, do you do the homework? Are you getting anything from these lessons? And they're like, oh yeah, I'm kind of learning stuff. And I use apps and I was like, I don't want to sit and look at my phone. I want to talk to people in Japanese. Um, so I said to them, let's meet halfway through the week and um, do our homework together. We'll, we'll meet and do our homework together. So they were like, yeah, okay. So we met up, they opened up their textbooks and they, we sat in silence as they looked at the textbooks. And I was like, oh, this is happening again. So I said, hey, let's chat in Japanese while we do the homework. Let's make the sentences while we do the homework. 
And, and that's kind of how it developed. Um, in the meantime, I'd been going to loads and loads of events for the Jet Alumni Association, so people who had taught in Japan. Um, also people that hadn't been on Jet but had been to Japan who were interested in Japanese culture would come to the Jet AA events. Um, and I'd met lots of Japanese people via that and, and made friendships. And I mentioned that I was doing this, comp this study group, that's what it was. And they offered to come along and help us study. Once I got them there, of course, I was like, let me buy you a drink. Do you know what? Will you just speak to us in Japanese the entire time that you're here? I'll pay for all the drinks that you're here while you're here. And of course, they were like, yeah, of course, we're in Starbucks. Hey, it's expensive. So, uh, so I just was like so happy to have them only using Japanese. And it was kind of like a bribe. If you, you know, I'll buy all your drinks as long as you only speak to us in Japanese. And they were well up for it, of course, because it was their native language. They could just chat away and get all the drinks they wanted. No one ever took advantage, though. They usually kind of had one drink the whole time. Mm. So people started hearing about this group. And of course, I was still going to loads of events and telling people, oh, I have this group, we do this. Suddenly, there were 30 people coming along. Um, and it was every week. Uh, we got too big for our first cafe. Um, we ended up moving to out of Starbucks and into... Um, it was a place called Burger, which was a kind of a restaurant, but it was it was more of a laid back restaurant. So you went up to the counter and you you got your burger and then you could sit down and they sold alcohol as well. So it wasn't a pub, but it was kind of a chilled out restaurant. And it was perfect because we would meet straight after work and um, people would be hungry. So they would grab some food and then we'd sit, we'd have a few drinks together and we would chat in Japanese. So that is how everything started with my conversation community back in 2014 here in Edinburgh. Of course, because we kept moving location um, for a time before we got to the burger restaurant, um, we set up a Facebook group and we put the event out so that people could tell where we were going to be and they could find it on Facebook as well. Um, so we built this little community, we had a Facebook group and um, people started to want to get into the group from other places so like not in Edinburgh not even in Scotland some of them were in America some of them were in Japan some of them were in Israel you know it was just and they kept requesting to get into the group and I was like I would message them and say you know we're based in Edinburgh this is a group in Edinburgh Are you coming to Edinburgh they were like no 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 just I want to be part of your community. I've seen it on, on Facebook. It came up in my feed. So I was like, okay, well, um, come into the group. So they started to chat in the groups and then people just kept asking, how do we join online? How, how do we take part in this conversation club online? And I was like, we don't have an online conversation club. And they kept saying, but can you do one? Can you do one? So I started researching and at the time Skype was the main thing that people used to talk on the internet. And, but you could only have two people at a time on Skype at that time. This was back in 2017. Um, and so I started researching and then I found this program called Zoom that nobody had ever heard of. Um, and I tried to convince them like try Zoom, try Zoom. Mm -hmm. um, and then we got this going and I started to do a lunchtime session. So I, I was working at the Japanese consulate here in Edinburgh. Um, and so I would leave the consulate. I only live five miles away from five minutes away from it by walk by on foot. Um, so I would run home, set up my computer. We would get onto Zoom. They had a 40 minute limit before I cut out. So we would do the 40 minutes. I would quickly grab a banana and run back to work because that was my lunchtime. Um, and so I did that, did that once a week. And then I'd advertised it in the Facebook group, but there were people in different parts of the world. And they're like, but we can't make that. It's in the middle of the night for us, or we can't make that, I'm at work. Um, can you do one in the evening for the people in, you know, in different parts of the world? So was, okay, I'll do one at eight o'clock in the evening in the UK, the following week. So the first week had been lunchtime, the following, the next week was in the evening, and we've got more people came to that one. 
And then other people started messaging and say, I can't make either lunchtime or the evening. Can you, can you do a morning session, please? There's... So I was like, okay, so the third week, I did a morning session. I got up extra early, got showered, got ready for work, did the session, and then ran to the office um, just in time to start work. And then everybody was like, oh, that was amazing, but I don't want to wait three weeks until you do the time that I can do again. Can you do it weekly? So I was like, so I'm going to have to do these three times a week, every week. So I started doing that. And of course, think there was just more going on. There were more people messaging. There was more happening in the Facebook group. I was also organizing um, immersion events with my in-person group. So we would go, uh, we all meet, speak only Japanese from the moment we meet. And then we would get on a train and we would go to another part of Scotland only speaking Japanese except to the train conductor where we would hand over our tickets and talk to him. Then we were talking together, it was only Japanese. And we would go and we would do some sightseeing and we would talk about what we were looking at and we would, you know, we'd discuss everything in Japanese, come back on the train, get back, whole day in Japanese. It was like four or five hours together. And then at the end of the day, we'd say goodbye. And that was it, we'd revert back to whoever we lived with, whatever language. We basically are a group that, depend, that um, pretends we're in Japan. That's basically what we do. Um, so then the online group um, just, it got so busy and I just saw that there was, after five years at the consulate, I saw there was something else that I needed to do. I needed to help people to speak Japanese, no matter where they lived in the world. Um, and so I quit working at the consulate with the golden handcuffs, very well paid, really easy job, five minutes from my house, all the, all the markings of the perfect job for me. Um, and I, I left to, to start running uh, the conversation club uh, as my own business. And that brings us up to today, six years after the conversation club actually began here in Edinburgh. That's amazing. So if you could compare the first day you did uh, the Japanese conversation club to today, like what has changed? So um, there is more, more organized. <laughs> so in the beginning, it was just kind of just sit down, people would turn up and they'd be like, what should we talk about? Oh, I don't know, what do you want to talk about? Um, now, obviously, the, the group's not running at the moment because of COVID, the Friday group. Um, so what we do instead is um, we, we do everything online. We have six sessions a week online. Yes, it's grown to six sessions a week. And um, because we have Zoom, I'm able to separate people into Zoom rooms, uh, depending on their level and abilities. And I also sometimes, you know, I do, I switch people around during the course of the Zoom meeting so that everybody gets to speak with different people, get to know people in the community. Because one of the, the major things about this is that, you know, we're a, we're a family now, we're a group um, and we look out for each other and we've known each other now for quite some time. Um, so we, and we protect, we protect the people in the group as well. So you can, you can tell who's too shy to, to speak up. So we don't put the pressure on them to, to speak. We just kind of, you know, part of learning Japanese and learning to speak and communicate is listening for a really long time, right? I remember going to Japan and it, I was there my whole first year on the JET program. I, I don't think I spoke, <laughs> uh, very, well, very little anyway. Whenever I was in a group of JETs, even the JETs that arrived at the same time as me, everyone was so much quicker to pick up the language than me. And um, I think I was just processing for a really, really, really long time. So I know what it's like to just feel that frustration and be like, nothing's coming out of my mouth. I know what I need to say. And I, I recognized that word three minutes ago and now I have something to say about it, but this, this, the conversation's moved. Um, so yeah, it was just like all of those frustrations I know what it feels like and I want I want to protect the people coming into our group and but but you know coax them on you can do this I've been there so many of us have been there 
So we actually get a lot of members who are very shy, uh, not confident, but you know, they really, they really blossom in our group. And I think it, that's, yeah, that just makes me feel all warm and toasty inside that we're really making a difference to people that have really felt stuck, you know, the, some of them have, um, they've been learning for years. Some people are just, they're so good at kanji. Kanji is not my thing, right? I, I, I can write it on a phone and write it on a computer because it brings it up and I recognize it, but it's not what I'm passionate about. Um, there's people in the community who absolutely love kanji. They love wani kani. They go nuts for, you know, learning all the kanji, the radicals and everything. And I, I just want to speak to people and, and um, help others communicate. So, yeah. Understood. Sorry, I've gone off on a tangent. You just asked me how it's changed. <laughs> right, right. No, that was perfect. That was perfect. And um, so uh, you don't have to tell us any names, but do you have any like stories of people who came into the, into Nihongo Connection and then they were kind of shy, but then through encouragement, they opened up. Do you have any stories like that? You don't have to mention any names. Okay, so there's one guy who, um, he, he's one of these amazing kanji studying people. He's now got N1. Um, he, came, he came to the group with, he, I think he must have already been at N3 level when he arrived at the group. And he... Um, he had realized that he couldn't speak. He had done all these years of study and he'd got so far and he knew so much, but he was like, why can't I speak, right? Um, and he turned up at the group and he just came on leaps and bounds. You know, he, I mean, he helps me to run the sessions now. He's one of my moderators in the in the Facebook group because he's just he's just brilliant and he he I mean he, he gets all those people who are really into kanji as well so he'll really go for the conversations about the kanji but then he really loves to to chat as well and um yeah he's brilliant um we've also got um several people oh this was so exciting several people had never been to Japan and um, it was actually last year, the end of last year, hardly anyone was coming to the group in Edinburgh because everybody had gone to Japan. <laughs> they were all there at the same time and they were meeting up and they met up with the Japanese um, native speakers who we'd met online or I had met in Japan and had connected them with. And they stayed with them in Japan and, you know, they... It, and they were posting pictures in the community and it was just like, oh my God, you guys have met through our community. And you were speaking to each other only in Japanese. And the other thing is, as soon as people turn up in our group, it's Japanese only. So they walk through the door of the cafe or the restaurant or wherever it is that we happen to be. And it's konbanwa. You know, it's not like, hi guys. First it's like konbanwa. And then they sit down and I have to admit for absolute beginners, because a lot of absolute beginners show up, it's really daunting. You know, they're like, oh, rabbit headlights. Oh. But what we do now is I send um, the conversation. So I'll approach them and ask them or just say, hi, konbanwa, just des. And if they're able to respond, you know, depending on their level, I'll, try to see what I can get from them. And then I will send them to the appropriate group of people that's around the same level as them that can give them the same support. And the complete beginners, I kind of brought in and because of my English teaching background, I use a lot of games and visual cues and things and, and get them playing games straight away, just using Japanese words in games, like picture games. I mean, I've got these story cards, so I just kind of, First of all, show them the pictures on the card and just like tell them what it is in Japanese. So like Akachan and stuff like this. So yeah, um, who else have we got that? So there's 
so we had a we met a girl at she's she went to Oxford University and then out to Japan as part of her course when she first arrived she was like 16 or 17 when she joined our group um, and she was dying to talk it was so cool she was like ah, ah, you know the words couldn't come out of her mouth fast enough she'd been looking for somewhere to speak you know i'd seen her at the groups at the events a few times other events that were run by the consulate or by edinburgh university japan society and things like that um and she was always kind of talking to people and walking around but you know as soon as she heard about our group she was like i have to come to your group so yeah it's exciting it's really exciting when people find us and they're like i've been looking for you <laughs> it, it sounds super exciting but um you know when i was learning english in venezuela in our class we were doing the same thing like we had to speak english to each other but yeah. like at, at the same time you know we know that our native le language is spanish so speaking to each other in English was kind of not like, you know, kind of weird, kind of awkward. Yeah. Do you guys have that feeling sometimes? In the beginning, everyone has that feeling. Uh -huh. And also people get really um, self-conscious about their language ability. Mm. A lot of people will say, I don't like speaking to foreigners in Japanese. You know, there's the people that are like, I don't want to speak to native Japanese speakers because I'll, I'll feel really embarrassed if I make a mistake. And then there's the ones that are like, I'd rather speak to a native Japanese speaker. I don't want to speak to a foreigner because I just feel they really intimidate me. You know, so there's the, the both, both groups. Really? Um, there's, I mean, yeah. You, when I meet somebody new as well, and I'll start speaking to them in Japanese, there's always that... <laughs> anticipation but it's I think that's you know that can be the same with just meeting somebody and speaking in your own language you, you, know, you meet mm -hmm. someone for the first time you're like oh what do they think of me you know is that always that kind of ego kicks in right and you just got to get rid of it just just try to communicate with that person and, and see where you jive really where you've got similar interests and things and you're not going to get on with everyone Mm -hmm. but, yeah definitely uh, something i wanted to ask you is you know i live in japan so i i have to speak japanese like in my business in my daily life what inspires people who live outside japan to learn such a complex language as japanese like what like what is it about japanese that that inspires so many people to learn it what is it so uh, within my group, um, there's a lot of people that like anime, manga. Um, there's also people that just love to try a different language. You know, there's uh, in the UK anyway, we are given the choice usually of German and French. Some places may be Spanish. Um, that's at least at, at high school and some middle schools if they still exist in some places like when i grew up um so i think it's just the other the you know it's like ah oh, you know this is a bit more exciting than a latin or german germanic based language i want to just do something a bit different um some people had no intention and of learning the language and then they just went on holiday to japan and then they came back and they were like oh wow that was awesome. I want to go back, but next time I actually want to understand what's going on. <laughs> um, then you've got the people who meet a Japanese person over here or whatever country they're based in, um, make friends with that person or begin a relationship with that person. And then they're kind of like, okay, well, this is going to be part of my life and I want to learn about this person. I want to communicate on another level with this person. Um, so, yeah, there's so many, so many different reasons. I mean, I didn't, I didn't, I, I mean, I told you the story before, but I know people here don't know. I didn't plan to study Japanese. Japanese hounded me until I gave up. Um, I have a background in studying French for six years, and I was 
terrible. And I'm not just saying that's what I thought. That's what I was told. <laughs> and I was actually, I did uh, three years, four years at middle school. And then I was going to high school and you could choose to, t to try German at high school. And I was like, wow, I sucked at French. And I'd been told by my French teacher, you suck. So I was like, I'm gonna try German. So I made the application to the school. And when I got my timetable, I didn't have German on the timetable. I just had French. So I went to the administrator and I was like, oh, hey, my timetable says I have French, but I actually requested German. And she was like, hang on a second. She looked in my file and she was like, oh, so yeah, your French teacher at your previous school recommended that you stick with French because you wouldn't be able to manage German. Jesus. And I was like, <laughs> ouch. <laughs> wow, I'm that bad? <laughs> Burn. So um, wow. yeah, so I had this belief that I am a terrible language learner and I'm never gonna get anywhere with language. So, um, so then I thought, okay, well, language isn't for me. Put it away. Um, continued on my path to become a primary school teacher, which was what I was going to do. Uh, trained at university to do that, but spent my first summer working in America on Camp America, where I met some Europeans. Uh, from Croatia and Poland specifically and they said to me you should teach English as a foreign language we need people like you to come to you know to Croatia to Poland to other parts of Europe and just yeah you'd be perfect for that um, so I thought well I could do that you know that would be fun that I, I could travel more so uh, I went to uh, a Kind of a crash course weekend it was just an introduction to teaching english as a foreign language at my university and the teacher got us to fill in a form say what our history was with languages and i was like bad french can't do it um she started the lesson and she said right first of all i want to talk to you about how are you going to teach people english when they don't understand english and i was like yeah how does that work um, she said, right, I've seen all your forms. I can see what language none of you speak. I'm like, okay. She said, I'm going to teach you for 30 minutes in that language. So I'm teaching you that language in that language. No other language for 30 minutes. And I was like, oh no, this is going to be so humiliating. <laughs> it's going to be awful. Um, and guess what language she chose? <laughs> it was Japanese. So... I was like, oh God, this is going to be really bad. Um, so she started off and she just kind of, she just looked at us and she would say, I can't remember what her name was. I wish I could remember her, her name and follow up and say thank you. Um, let's say her name was Jane. And she would just be like, Jane, Jane. You know, doing the whole point of the nose. And we were like, okay. And she's like, okay, uh, Jess, Jess. And she was like, you know, and then she said, Jane Des, Jane Des, well, Jess Des. And then we went round and we would turn to each other and just go, Jess Des. And then she introduced, you know, like, Anatawa, even though technically, you know, she shouldn't really say Anatawa to people. But, you know, she was just teaching us the basics. So she was Anatawa. And then we were all introducing ourselves. By the end of the lesson, I could say, Hajime Mashte, Jess Des. Yoroshku. I think that's pretty much what she taught us. And then all the numbers. And I found the numbers super easy, especially with having come from learning French. You know, in French, you have to do mental arithmetic when you get to certain numbers. And I was like, I don't do maths. So you're making me do maths in French. It's not going to work. Yeah. But in Japanese, it's just like, okay, we'll just switch those numbers around like 12, 20, brilliant, 30, 13. I can do this. Oh my God, I can, I can count to 100. So mm -hmm. after half an hour, I was like, this is super cool. Um, but I had no intention of learning Japanese. I was going to be an English teacher and I was going to teach in Europe. That was what I was going to do. So I just left that. I was like, oh, that was fun. Then the universe decided to put some other experiences in my way. Um, I was a senior student at my university. That involved living on campus and looking after freshers. 
So just making sure that they were okay, mental health kind of support, things like that. But also the odd thing, like people getting themselves locked out. And then I would call the warden and he would come and let them in. So one day I had this girl turn up on my doorstep, a um, small Asian lady, and she just said, oh, my key's broken. And I was like, oh, okay, where's your flat? And we walked and um, I said, oh, where are you from? Because I'm kind of interested in people. And so she said, oh, I'm from Japan. So I'm like, oh, uh, ooh, hmm. Hajime maste, jestes, yoroshiku. And she was like, oh, Nihongo Josu desu ne. And I was like, no, no, what, what? No, now I'm stuck. I don't know. I don't know what you just said. What? And um, she was like, ah. Oh. And she was so excited. And I never had that response to me speaking a foreign language before. I'd only ever had, you know, from my French teachers. So I was like, oh. Wow, that was cool. Um, and then she wanted to introduce me to her Japanese friends and she'd be like, do it again, do it again, do it again. So I had to say over and over and over and over to her friends. Um, and then she wanted to meet and we would go to, to the cafe together and, you know, we became friends. Mm -hmm. And every time we met, she would teach me more. And I was like, oh, okay, cool, I'll learn, but I'm not really going to learn a language. I'm bad at languages. So then I got a part-time job and I was working in a Chinese restaurant. And I was behind the bar making the drinks. So the waitresses would come, or the waiter waitresses would come, tend to be females. Um, they would ask for the drinks. I'd put them on the tray. They would take the tray to the customer. There was one girl that worked there who never spoke to any of the other girls. Um, and I, one day I said to her, you know, you're not friends with them? She said, like, oh, I don't understand what they're saying. I don't, I don't, speak, I don't speak Chinese or Mandarin. Or Cantonese, I'm not sure which one it was. Um, she said, I'm from Japan. And I was like, oh, uh, hajime mashite, just des, yoroshiku. She was like, oh, nihongo wakarimasu kara. And I was like, whoa, 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 slow down, slow down, slow down. She said, oh, are you learning Japanese? And I was like, well, I'm not technically, no. She said, oh, let me teach you, let me teach you. So I would spend my, my four, five, six hour shift making drinks and learning Japanese just because she would, if we were on the same shift, so I, I was learning Japanese without trying to learn it. It was just coming at me. Um, and then the final straw that broke me, and was like, okay, uh, was I was in the library at university, which doesn't happen very often. I used to take the books and run away. I didn't stay in the library. Um, but I was hanging out in the library and there was a girl from my high school walked in. Now I went to university four hours drive away from where I grew up. Um, and I didn't see people from high school very often. Uh, and she walked in and I was like, oh, hey, what are you doing here? And she said, oh, I'm, I'm doing a presentation. Uh, do you wanna come hang out while I do the presentation then we'll go get some lunch? I was like, yeah, okay. What's your presentation on? She's like, oh, it's teaching English abroad. I was like, oh, I wanna do that. Oh, that's what I wanna do. She was like, oh, come along. So I went in there. And it was a presentation on the JET program. And I sat there and I thought, why does this keep happening? Why does Japan keep coming into my life? How come I've learned some Japanese without trying? How come I happened to be in the library when she came? I, I might not have seen her at all that day. I wouldn't have seen her. So, and this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to teach abroad. I was going to teach in Europe, but okay, I'll go with this. I'll go with Japan. And then I was like, okay, and now I'm going to figure out how to learn this language. And then I self-studied using remembering the kana from Heisig. Um, and I found that I learned hiragana in about a week, which really surprised me. Um, and then moved on to katakana. And then I was actually, while I was writing my dissertation, I was actually putting my dissertation down and picking up my <laughs> Japanese study books and I was studying in between, which was crazy. And um, I got this, I just had this urge to, to learn the language and of course prepare myself for Japan. And when I applied for the JET program, I actually asked for Inaka. I asked for the most rural place they could give me 
because I thought, hell, you know, drop me in it. I obviously need to just have this immersive experience. Um, otherwise, I think I'm going to just bottle it and speak to everyone in English. Um, and then they placed me in Oita Prefecture, not complete in Aka, um, but I and I I just got on in the community with karate and taiko and um, joined a Japanese drama group and just spent all my time with Japanese people. <laughs> yeah, really went for it. All right, perfect. So. I wanted to know regarding Japanese, what are some of the difficulties that people face when learning Japanese, like specifically the Japanese language? Well, it depends on the language that they've come from. Um, there's people from lots of different backgrounds in uh, my community. Um, generally, conjugation is a massive trip up, you know, it's like, ah, what do I do with this one? You know, is it group one, group two? Oh, that's irregular, God, I hate those ones. Um, so the conjugation really gets people. Uh, if people, people do get really hung up on kanji, if they're, if they're the ones that are passionate about learning kanji, that's fair enough. But I have to keep telling them, you know, can, knowing kanji is not gonna stop you from speaking. Not knowing kanji and not knowing kanji is not going to stop you from speaking. Um, so yeah, I think mainly the conjugation and then overcoming the fear of speaking and overcoming the fear of making mistakes time and time again. And that How whole... How do you do that? Because I feel like it's so ingrained in us as human beings, you know. Like we kind of have like a mental barrier to try new things that will bring us pain <laughs> how do you overcome that um games i play a lot of games uh with my community members so if it seems like somebody's getting a bit freaked out um then i will introduce a game element and try to trick them into believing that they're just playing a game <laughs> instead of having it focus too much on the conversation. So there's things like, um, you know, shiritori. We love shiritori where you take the, the end of the last word to make the next word. So like, neko, konnichiwa, and things like that. So, you know, we might stop the conversation and be like, shiritori shimashou. And then we can just go around and everybody gets their confidence back up again because they're like, okay, I don't have to think about making this a sentence. I'm just, I'm just playing a game. And I know words. I know words. I know lots of words. And, you know, it's helping them to realize that they know, they know loads of stuff. It's just that in that moment, in that conversation, their brain just went, ah, this is too much. And it stopped them. I feel you. So, you know, you, you teach the language, conjugation, kanji, and all these things. But uh, I feel like if you learn a language, mm -hmm. which in my opinion is, is something that a lot of uh, Japanese native speakers have difficulties with when they learn English, is that how to integrate the culture to the language. Because for example, if I speak Japanese the way I speak English, like that's not gonna work out. Or if I speak English, or sorry, the way, I, if I speak Spanish, the way I speak English, it's not gonna work out because the culture and the language, they go hand in hand. Yes. Yeah. How do you teach that culture of, you know, not being straightforward, kind of being vague, um, being polite, and kind of like, uh, I, I don't know if this is the right way to say it, but kind of like minimize yourself. Mm-hmm to be more polite and like make others seem bigger, like with like Son Kego and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Like, how do you teach that cultural aspect? So that comes from um, the native speakers in my community. So just by having them be a part of the community and having them on the calls and having them come to our in-person events, you know, everybody's watching what the native speakers are doing and how they're saying things and I think as well just the nature of my community having 
us being the way we are, we attract the people who are looking for the confidence boost. So they tend to be more careful anyway. They're the ones that will not say something in case it's wrong, rather than say it to make that mistake to learn. They will hold, they're the ones that hold back and really want to make sure that they're not going to A, insult anyone, and B, embarrass themselves. So, yeah, it's, and I think when they see, especially with me, I mean, I can't say, how do you mean it without nodding my head? You know, it's just, <laughs> when you've got enough people in the group who have lived in that culture and have soaked the language into their being so that they actually do the things you know whenever i demonstrate like speaking on a phone i'll be like hey mush mush hey 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 what kind of master hey hey josh stage miles stage miles you know i can't not be that culture when i'm speaking that language and i think that when the people in my community see the native speakers doing that and then they see the experienced people in my community also manage their do, you know, like doing the the manners, the same manners and the same Mimiki. body language. They they learn it too. It kind of kind of spreads. <laughs> mm -hmm. Interesting, interesting. So that's how they learn the culture, huh? Have they did they experience any sort of culture shock when they came to Japan? Because, you know, like they're learning Japanese in your group and then they go to Japan and they experience the real thing, right? Like, did they experience any culture shock or something like that? It depends on the person. Mm -hmm. It really depends. Um, because there's, there's some people that, are, like I say, are really into um, anime um, or they, you know, they watch Terrace House. So they, they kind of see the culture. They've seen it and they watch Japanese films, you know, um, so the ones that have have done a lot of that have maybe less culture shock, but I still think that everybody gets a little culture shock. You know, there was one guy who who's he's he's read manga, he'd seen anime, he really loves Japanese culture. He went to Japan and he was like, I just it looks like I'm in a manga, so realistic. <laughs> it's like it looks exactly like a manga. And it's like, well, yeah, what do you think it's based on? You know, and he, but he didn't, he, I don't know, he just thought it was um, like, uh, what's the word I'm looking for here? The English word. Um, a stereotype. He thought it was some kind of stereotype happening, right? And he got there and he was like, oh, wow, no, it's actually like this. It's really, like, the cars really look like, they look like little toy Lego cars. And, you know, he, he was just blown away. Yeah. So there's, I think, I don't, I think you can, everyone's going to get cold to shock. I think he just, yeah, it just happens. Definitely. So Jessica, let's say someone, you know, they go to the Nihongo Connection website, they like it, they seem interested, and then they want to join. What are some of the benefits of joining Nihongo Connection? Because I've seen you have some videos, like some courses and stuff like that. Like what are some of the benefits that people can get? So um, for complete beginners, we do conversation classes. Um, so we're going to get you speaking right from the start, you know. Um, I work in Zoom and offer Google document just to help with the pronunciation, but it's, it's really just, we spend the whole hour talking in Japanese and I just keep it going round and round and round. Um, uh, but then the conversation club is, I mean, the opportunity to speak up to six, well, six times a week. So people can come as many times as they want. Uh, we have people join from Japan because they were English teachers in Japan and they just found that they they went to work because they spoke English all day and then they just wanted to chill out in the evening so they'd meet other English teachers and drink in a bar somewhere and then they would go home and sleep and then they'd get up really early and go to work and teach English all day and then they'd spend time with their other teachers and and they were like, I'm not, I'm in Japan and I'm not learning any Japanese, you know, it's easily done. 
it's easily done. Um, so yeah, it's we're there for for anyone really, wherever they are in the world, circumstance for location. So there's no opportunity to speak Japanese, and that's what we're there for. Perfect. I'm actually uh, putting your link on the chat so that people can check your website. Perfect. All right. Thanks very much. Sorry, my partner's on a work call, so you can probably hear him in the other room. <laughs> it's all good. No worries. So, Jessica, if you could give us some um, tips on how to build a community. Okay. Any tips? Any tips at all. So, um, if you want an in-person community, then first of all, you just go to all the events you can possibly find um, and just talk to people, uh, get to know people, um, build those relationships. It's all relationship building, isn't it? You know, um, like I said, I started off going to Japanese lessons and then I spoke to the other people in the class and um, found out what they were struggling with. That's again, the pain points of the people. Find out what, they, what it is that they're struggling with. Try to help them, give them tips and strategies that have worked for you or tips and strategies you've heard that work for other people because everybody learns differently. Everyone has a different learning style. Um, and once you've got, you know, a few people you've got to know, say, hey, do you, you want to hang out and speak Japanese for like an hour on Thursday at this coffee shop? Um, and then you can start organizing day trips like I did. Those are really fun. So like, we're going to do three hours in Japanese. Are you up for the challenge? Let's do it. And you start advertising it on all the different platforms. Um, and then gradually you'll just start to get to know people online as well. Because if you're constantly posting events on Facebook, people see those in the local area. People see those who aren't in the local area that have an interest in that thing. And they start to request to get into the Facebook group and to join in. Um, so yeah, talk to people and attend events. I mean, even events like this, if anyone wants to chat to me afterwards, they can contact me. Um, just get to know people, see how you can help. Oh, you're on mute. Oh, sorry. What is the easiest way to find you? So, um, I'm everywhere. <laughs> uh, you can just put Nihongo Connection into Google and it will pull up all my profiles. Um, we've got Instagram, we've got, I'm on LinkedIn, we've got Facebook, uh, the page and the group. Um, we've even got a, um, a board on Pinterest. If you're a Pinterest fan, you can get loads of Japanese language resources in Pinterest. It's amazing. So if you've never thought about going to Pinterest, seriously go there. There's loads of flashcards and images and it's just beautiful. Um, uh, yeah, so Nihongo Connection. That's and perfect. Um, I have another question for you. I think it's a little bit more difficult than the other ones. Um, for us foreigners coming into Japan, what is the best way to culturally assimilate? Because, of course, we can learn the language and all these things, but how can we successfully integrate into the culture? Should we come from a mentality of, all right, I need to forget my roots and become Japanese? Or like, what, what, what is the correct mindset in your opinion? Just be open. Yeah, just be open. Don't, you don't have to forget your own um, culture, but just be open to another way of doing things, thinking about things in a different way considering other people's opinions and weighing them up against the opinion, the opinion that you had. Because, you know, you've grown up in one family that's told you and you've learned a certain way of doing things. But that's just one family in millions. It's the same with cultures. You know, I grew up, I grew up in England, but even moving up to Scotland, there's things that are different up here. And it's like, oh, that's how they do it here. Oh, there's a different word for that. Oh, that's weird. Okay, cool. Do that differently. Um, yeah, just, just, I know, I mean, don't get me wrong. There were frustrating times in Japan. 
you know, I, I tend to open myself up like, oh, okay, I understand your point of view. I'm, I will do this your way because this is the way it's done here. And then there, of course, there wasn't that give back, you know, why don't you like the way I'm doing things? This is how my culture does it. You know, I, I got in trouble because there was a stray cat outside my apartment. So I put out a little saucer of food for it. You know, it had no owner. It was covered in fleas. So I bought a, I bought a flea collar for it and put out some food for it. Got into trouble because, you know, like, you shouldn't do that. And I was like, I, I look after cats. I look after creatures, you know. And they're like, no, you leave it. You leave it alone. Um, that was really hard for me. I was like, but why wouldn't you help a creature that's in distress? You know, it's like, because it's, you know, it's, a, it's not part of the system it's not owned by somebody it's you leave it be um, but that's just where I you know the background I come from so every time we have a thought that doesn't work with someone else you've got to kind of pick it apart like okay well how can how can this be better understood by both of us how can we work together in this situation a hundred percent I feel you because I had a similar experience when I was working in a Japanese company and you know like of course, I, I lived in the United States for a long time, but I'm from Venezuela. Like, you know, like Hispanics, we're passionate and we're happy and we move and, you know. And when I was in the company, they're like, you smile too much or you enjoy work too much. Like, like you're too chill. And I'm like, whoa. But, you know, like, like you said, it's just having different perspectives. But it does sometimes, you know, like not hurt, yeah. but like, ah. Oh. Yeah. Uh, you, yeah, your behavior can annoy people. I lived with a Japanese family for a while and one of the sisters was more like me, they'll say, and the other one was more reserved. And, and what the more reserved one, one day she just said, why do you, why do you act the way you do? Why do you dress the way you do? I'm like, because that's who I am, mm. you know? And she was like, yeah, but it annoys me. And I'm like, I'm really sorry I annoy you. Um, I'll you know, I'll try to tone it down a bit while I'm with you. And I know, you know, if it makes you uncomfortable, I don't want to make you uncomfortable, but this is me. Um, and I'm going to try and be a little less overbearing on you. Mm -hmm. If you can be a bit more understanding that this is how I am. Right. And you, you just have to talk. You just have right. to talk. Definitely. Communication. You. Communication, definitely. Perfect. I think that's about it. Awesome. Jessica, so ah, before I forget, the quote. What is your quote? So the quote that is on my, I've actually not got it up in front of me and I can't remember. It's just like, what's going on in your head is, they're just thoughts, you know, and you can change them. Mm -hmm. So you just have to, you know, that whole thing. If you say that you're nervous, your body's going to react differently. So if you say you're excited, there's similar, there's similar reactions in the body, but if you say you're excited when you feel nervous, it takes the edge off of it and it makes it easier to deal with. Mm -hmm. So it's just a matter of kind of considering your thoughts and kind of trying to change them a little bit to, to overcome the difficulties you're having. Perfect. And what about the song? What is the song that inspired you the most? So I really love Eminem. I know it's a bit rude. Lose yourself. Um, I just, oh, I just, um, whenever I was, when I was a taiko drummer and getting up on stage, you know, your hands are sweating and, you know, Eminem says it, hands are sweating, knees are weak. Yeah, he feels sick, that sort of thing. That was before going on stage. That would be it. But your hands are sweating when you're trying to, before you even start to pick up the bachi because you're nervous, it, you can't lose hold of those bachi because they're just going to fly, you know. So that just, every time I would hear that song, it really, you know, lose yourself in the music moment. It just, yeah, that was perfect for playing taiko on stage for me. Just, yeah. I love it. I love that song so much. <laughs> awesome. It's good, right? it's good, right? Thank you so much. Now we'll go to the Q&A section. So guys, please, uh, I'm going to give you a couple of minutes so you think about your questions. 
remember, if you want to, if you don't mind being recorded and you would like to ask Jessica directly, please type the, the question on your chat so that everyone can see it. If you don't want to appear on the chat, just message to me privately. All right, I'm gonna give you all two minutes and let's think about those questions. If you have your question, just type it. I've done quite a lot of talking. I might have covered most of the questions. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see if they have questions. So Jessica, while, the, while our audience, while they're thinking about some of their questions, any tips for studying Japanese? Anything that helps, like watching anime or? Anything? I would say don't study Japanese. I don't believe in studying Japanese. I believe in living it. Um, imagine that you are a Japanese speaker. You just tell yourself, I speak Japanese and um, live the language. Don't think of it as a subject that needs to be studied. Wow, that takes the fun right out of it. Um, I would, yeah, if, if anyone says to me, oh, when can I fit in Japanese into my life? I'm like, that sounds like something that has to be done. Mm -hmm. um, I would just incorporate it into your life. Just make it part of what you do. You know, you have an alarm clock in the morning, right? So if maybe it's your phone goes off. Maybe it's a song. Change it into a Japanese language song. Maybe it's an alarm that says it's 8.30. It's 7.30. Change, record yourself saying it's 8.30. It's 7.30. Put that into your phone. Make that your wake up. Um, if you have the radio come on, have a Japanese radio station come on instead of an English language one. You know, you wake up to the sounds of Japanese. Um, when you're commuting, you know, everyone listens to podcasts, reads a book or something, depending on, don't read while you're driving, obviously. Uh, <laughs> depending on what form of transport you're using, you could be listening to Japanese podcasts, you could be reading a dual, you know, the dual readers, uh, where you have English on one side of the page and Japanese on the other. Um, yeah, just incorporate the language, put post-it notes all over your house, labeling the things that what they're called in Japanese. Voice message people, you know, Messenger, Instagram, we've both got the little uh, microphone. You just press it and you can talk to someone. Find a an Instagram Japanese teacher that you absolutely love and then send them a message, an Instagram messenger. All right, perfect. Thank you so much. Let's go to the questions. Our first question is from Anthony. Anthony, the floor is yours. All right, good evening and uh, great to see you, Angel and Jessica. Thank you for the presentation. Um, no my question is, what are your plans for the future? I mean, this sounds like a, a, something you're very involved with, but perhaps you want to grow or scale. Um, what, are, what are you thinking about the future? I would love to have lots of Nihongo Connection satellite groups around the world um, happening at different times. Um, and then we would link up via Zoom and have these kind of like, in-person virtual groups linked up. We had it when we were doing the groups in Edinburgh uh, before lo lockdown. Um, every Friday, I would have my iPad on the table and any of my members that were elsewhere in the world that couldn't come to the Edinburgh session, they would come to the, the Zoom session and they would play games within the Edinburgh session group. So I have the flashcards, like I have the picture cards up and we'd have certain games where you could, you know, we'd adapt games like Guess Who and things like that. You know, we'd um, find out what they had at home and we'd play the same games together. So that would be really cool as if every single conversation club session that we, the six of them that we have would be if, you know, there was a, group happening in Japan at the exact same time. So I'd have my um, Zoom room open, they'd have a Zoom and we just, yeah, we just communicate across across the planet. That would be really cool. Okay, well, thank you. Sounds great. All right, thank you, Anthony. 
our next question is from Thomas. Thomas, you have the floor. Hello, everybody. Uh, yeah, mine was just a uh, more of a cultural question, I suppose. Double whammy, um, which was for your favorite Japanese band, but also, I suppose, for like listening, like we're saying about sort of hopping on like the train or listening away in the car. I found it quite useful for me just to sort of yeah. listen away, to pick up odd words here and there. Oh, so. I know that works. I have to come clean here. I don't have um, a favorite Japanese band. Um, I really like Yoshida Kyodai. Oh, yeah. <laughs> they play shamisen. <laughs> They're like this really cool kind of rock shamisen um, brother duo. So oh. yeah, in that respect, I'm not a big listener to um, Japanese songs. Um, I, I, what I did do though is for my community, they, there's loads of people in the community too who absolutely love listening to Japanese groups, um, like baby metal and people like that. So we, we put together a Spotify oh, list. Cool. So the community, if you go, <laughs> Nihongo Connection has a Spotify list and that's all the songs that my community really loves. Um, there's a couple oh, nice. in there that I'm trying, cause I play guitar. So I'm trying to learn to play a couple of the songs, which the names of which have now gone out of my head. Uh, but I'm learning to play a couple of songs on the guitar and sing along. As oh, blimey. <laughs> yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm not a, I'm, yeah, that's it's something that I don't do, but I, I tell everybody in my community that it's a really good idea to sing along to Japanese songs. But for m myself, I'm more into Taiko and Yoshida Kyodai. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, no, that's really interesting. My wife said she said of she did Kyodai, so she's gonna give them out for me. <laughs> yes, they're awesome. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, thank you very much. Oh. We're about to get Akachan. <laughs> He's half Japanese. Yes. Oh. <laughs> half Japanese and squawking. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, no, thanks very much for uh, answering the question. You're welcome. All right. Thank you, Thomas. And we'll go, by the way, cute baby. Let's go to our last question. Go, oh, kawaii. <laughs> kawaii. Our last question is from Bodan, and it says, what is the hardest thing to learn in Japanese language, in your opinion, Jessica? The hardest thing? For me, well, for me, um, for me, it's kanji, cause just because it's just not, I'm not driven to learn it. So when you don't have that enthusiasm for something, <laughs> you just kind of like, mm. I mean, it's not something that I would, sit down and have pleasure looking at <laughs> i i pick up it's quite cool actually how i pick up kanji quite a lot just just through writing to people to japanese friends online and then when i usually voice message people uh, but sometimes they write the reply back to me and then of course i have to figure out what they've written um so for me it's kanji yeah it's you know there's all kinds of people Everyone likes different things. Uh, I prefer to speak. Mm -hmm. Me too. I love speaking. <laughs> Alrighty. I guess those are all the questions that we have for tonight. I have added Jessica's LinkedIn. Oh, thank you. Um, LinkedIn link. Uh, Nihongo Connections website link. And also our Spotify playlist. So you guys can listen to Lose Yourself by Eminem. Yay. And Jessica, before we finish tonight, do you have any final message? Anything? So I would just say, um, you know, I've already spoken about my experience of learning French and the messages that I was given about my abilities. And I just want to tell you all that you got to ignore what people are saying about you and just create your own destiny because 
you know, they're wrong about you. <laughs> and lose yourself, right? Lose yourself in the music. <laughs> that's perfect okay jessica thank you so much for coming thank you and guys thank you so much for coming as well we'll have an event next friday as well same time same channel it was a pleasure to have you tonight jessica again thank you for coming and thank you guys thank you guys thank you so much have a good night thank you